and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the and stuff. This is episode number 108, where Eric had the opportunity to sit down with Bill Buskist, Professor Emeritus at Auburn University. But before we get to that, Psych Sessions is supported by STP. That's the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. If you're not a member, why not? That's what Eric and I want to know. They do have a couple of things that they would like you to know this week. Click on the awards and grants link on teachpsych.org for a list of upcoming deadlines for STP's awards and grants, including the Excellence in Teaching Awards, Civic Engagement Award, Mentorship Award, Instructional Resource Grants, and, listen closely, the inaugural Promoting Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Award. That's at teachpsych.org. Also, proposals for the virtual STP Division II program at APA 2021 are due January 12th. That's coming up quickly, January 12th, 2021. Please visit convention.apa.org backslash proposals. Well, Bill is retired now, but he did spend a number of years at Auburn University. And um, he tells a story here about how he carved out a little niche for himself there where uh, they knew that intro psych was going to be okay and that graduate students were going to be good teachers. And uh, they sort of uh, stopped pushing back and let Bill do his thing. And so uh, Bill is a great storyteller. That's one of the things I picked up in this conversation. And he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Eric dives with Bill into uh, Bill's origin story, and uh, we learned that uh, for him, college was an escape, and uh, BYU was a long way from where he grew up, and he wanted to be gone. Um, He says in this episode that his college major was not psychology, baseball. My college major was baseball. Um, and his motivation was uh, to be a professional. And uh, he kept grades up only as much as he needed to in order to play baseball because that was his single focus. I was reminded in this conversation how important teachers can be in the lives of their students. And uh, it sounded to me like if Bill didn't come across or cross the path of a couple of really important instructors during his college experience that he may not be Bill Buskist, who we know in the Society for the Teaching of Psychology and in teaching nationally. Um, First, a political science teacher uh, that he found inspiring. Next, a psychology teacher that he thought was extremely caring. And when I was thinking about those two qualities of of being inspiring and really caring, I thought to myself, well, that that is pretty much all the stories that I've ever heard of Bill Buskist um, and what he has done for students uh, and for for graduate students and the care that he has put into uh, our practice and uh, and has devoted for so many years at such a high level. Uh, He is indeed Uh, inspiring and caring. And he took those things and he uh, infused them into a very, very productive uh, and important career. I also noticed that there's this theme that runs through Bill's life, which is uh, competition, that he's a very competitive person. And I would assume that he is mostly competitive uh, internally and then only secondary competitive with other people. But um, he he does mention that uh, over his years, he's not only uh, done great things in teaching, but uh, he's done really ambitious things like uh, training for Ironman races. And so uh, you'll have to listen for that. But it really is not going to surprise you um, because he just operates at such a high level. 
It really was the content that got him into the psychology major, as it did for so many of us. Uh, For Bill, he fell in love with what he was learning, and he got really fascinated by it. Um, And then again, some great uh, inspiration from from teachers who were caring about him um, and who suggested to him that graduate school might be a thing that he might be interested in. Uh, And so that story is told here. After Bill finishes at BYU uh, with a graduate degree, he applies for 27 jobs and uh, he gets called back from zero jobs. The next year, it was 26. So here I am going to uh, pull out one other uh, trait that I think Bill probably has, which is um, some sort of stick to some persistence, some optimism that kept him going. If you've met Bill or any of his buddies that he has been been doing national teaching conferences with for a long, long time, uh, you probably have heard uh, them talk about these weekends that they uh, set aside to get together outside of teaching conferences uh, and really hosting one another in various cities across uh, America where they uh, just get together and enjoy each other's company. And I was reminded that uh, the STP is such a important um, and and just maybe teaching psychology um, professional development is so important um, because it does give us this opportunity to not only um, be better teachers, but to uh, make great friends and lifelong friends. And so to all my friends out there who I've met over the years, I was really thinking about so many of you when I was listening to this. And uh, I'm so thankful uh, that that we have this community that also offers these really, really lifelong um, and deep friendships. So um, you're going to really enjoy him listening to that. Of course, uh, Eric asks him about the teacher behavior checklist, and they talk about that just a bit. Um, but he discusses some of that formula and how that uh, represents uh, so many good teachers. And, uh, and and so I found that personally uh, interesting. I'd, I'd like to actually go back and look at the teacher behavior checklist again, um, you know, now that I'm into my mid-career, because it was a while ago that I looked at it last time. Um, All right. Well, I said at the beginning, in the end, he is a teacher's teacher, uh, literally. And uh, some of the proudest moments of his career are watching his former students get national teaching awards. And there have been a number of them, folks. So, um, Bill, we are so grateful for the impact that you have had on teaching of psychology. Uh, You left it in a great place. Uh, You are renowned. Um, you, uh, are inspiring to us. Uh, you, your care for your students is inspiring as well. And so without any further delay, this is Bill Buskist with Eric Landrum. Well, welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. And, you know, I tend to say that they're all special and they're all treats. And this one is an extra special treat. I'm here with an old friend of many of ours, or a dear friend, I should say, uh, Bill Buskis. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Eric. Uh, it, it's so good to be with you and to hear your voice. How are you doing these days? Doing pretty good. Retirement's a pretty wonderful thing. And uh, I'm happy I retired when I did. I retired at 63 and I've been retired full time for four years and and have really enjoyed every nanosecond of it. So thank you for asking. How about you? How are you doing these days? I, I, I'm doing well. Thank you. You know, um, I, uh, I've been in this career long enough that I, I'm pretty confident that I know what I'm doing. And uh, I get to work with uh, lovely people at Boise State and lovely people around the country and, you know, sometimes around the world. And uh, you know how it was. The further you got into the career, uh, the more, uh, well, for most of the time, the more power you had over who you got to work with and what you got to work on. So that that's very uh, that privilege is very empowering. That's right, and those those choices had to be earned. Uh, sometimes the hard way, you know, through the various promotions and tenure, and and getting involved in activities and organizations and moving up the scale and and just trying to make the right decisions. Absolutely. Now we were just chatting before I hit record about. Um, Today is fr- happens to be Friday the 13th, and you mentioned that you're not overly superstitious, except for when you used to play baseball. And 
I, of course, you know, one of the great things about having a podcast is that you get to know about people's backstories. So would you mind sharing, uh, when did you play baseball? Oh, absolutely. Uh, some of the best times of my life were on the, on the diamond. Um, I played baseball throughout high school and um, was very serious about it. And I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship um, of all places at Brigham Young University uh, out of high school. And so I I played for BYU for about a year, year and a half. And then I uh, did some severe damage to my right shoulder. I was a pitcher and I couldn't play anymore. But fortunately, I had an NCAA scholarship and they they paid the rest of my way through school. So I had my tuition and fees paid for. But the baseball team back then, I don't know what it's like now, but they only had half scholarships. They didn't have full scholarships. Um, I think the only team back then that had a full scholarship was the football team. But anyway, you know, back to the point of superstitions. Um, whenever I was pitching, no matter how I was doing, let's say I struck out the side in an inning, uh, people would want to come up and shake my hand and congratulate me. And I just avoided all that. I didn't want anybody to touch my right hand because I felt like if um, they touched me on the right hand, which was my throwing hand, that that would put some sort of jinx on it and I would start performing badly. And I did that throughout high school and throughout college. Um, At one point, I even uh, refused to um, sit in the dugout next to people. Uh, I just wanted to be by myself and focus on the game. So I, I I was pretty, pretty serious and pretty superstitious back then. But nowadays, you know, nothing matters. Well, okay. Maybe we'll come back to that. So first off, it doesn't surprise me that you were pretty serious about what you were doing. Um, I I can't imagine a, a young uh, Bill Buskis not being serious about what he had committed to. Um, uh, I, I don't know if, if you have an example, a counter example of that, but um you know, baseball players are like that. You know, if you're watching uh, on TV and they've got a no hitter going, uh, everyone in the dugout ignores them, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But um, baseball is a great game because there's so many quirks and there's so many quirky players and there's so much written about the game and said about the game. I think, you know, as my friend Barney Bynes likes to remind us sometimes that nobody talks about other sports about the way they do baseball, like they do baseball, because baseball is sort of a unique game. It's slow. It's the only kind of game that in which the defense actually controls the ball and not the offense. Uh, and because of that, you know, some really funny and interesting thing happens to people, and it, it changes the nature of the sport. Yeah, I I actually grew up uh, north of Chicago, and so I loved uh, the Cubs. Oh, and yeah. uh, as a kid, I could have told you uh, the starting lineup and the pitching rotation of the Cubs. And my dad would take me to a Cubs game about once or twice a year uh, for quite some time. And so, um, and and tried playing baseball. I never never got to the level that you got to, but you know, as a kid, played on teams and. Um, played a little bit in junior high and, and stopped there. So did you have aspirations to play professionally? Uh, yeah, it's what I was hoping to do, but that arm injury sort of squashed my career. And I was in contact with, during high school, you know, several uh, professional teams, but it was clear I wanted to go to college, um, particularly to get away from my hometown. My, my idea was that I would uh, – I would take a scholarship as far as away as I could get it. That was my primary primary criterion for getting out of town. The farther away away from town it was, the the more I, I would want to be there. So so since we're there, let, let's go there. Where where was the hometown? I grew up in a small community called Jamestown, New York, which is in the western part of the state. We were about um, forty five minutes an hour north of uh, well, actually like two or three hours from uh, Pittsburgh. Um, now we're south of Buffalo, about two or three hours east of Cleveland. So we grew up in a in the thick of uh, some really good sports teams, and you know, sports was really really big where, when I was growing up. And and so uh, Utah was as far away as you could go on a baseball scholarship. Yeah, and as it turned out, it was like going to a foreign land, right? Did you did you even know anything about Latter Day Saints or know that the or BYU was religious affiliated? I did not until I started getting information from them. Gotcha. So I, I grew up yeah. in a, a pretty non-religious family. Uh, 
my mom was married three times, divorced twice. My dad, who was committed to a mental institution when I was seven, was married uh, three times and divorced three times. Wow. So, you know, it was a really rough upbringing. Um, Not a lot of closeness and togetherness in our home, although my mom and my grandmother always made sure we were clothed. We had food on the table. We, We grew up, you know, in you know, if not in poverty, teetering on poverty. That, so that Bill, that does sound like a very challenging environment to be in. Absolutely. Uh, it was, it was. And I had no qualms about leaving town at all. I, I just knew that there was really not a future there for me. Where uh, d- do you have siblings? I have a sister who's two years younger. And did, did um, she, and, and again, I, I am veering now already into the none of my business department. Um, <laughs> hey, you're pretty good at that though, so far. I, well, I, <laughs> first off, thank you. And uh, of course, and we tell every guest you have full editorial control. So even if we chat about it, you can still do edits later. Um, did your sister have the same, um, uh, she wanted to exit that, that fit the family household as soon as possible? No. In fact, it was sort of the opposite. Um, at least uh, during the early years, she and my mom became very, very close. And, you know, she has, to even to this day, many of my mom's mannerisms and, uh, and behavior patterns. Gotcha. So, okay. Yes, that's sort of interesting. So she actually hung, hung around Jamestown for quite a while, and then she married a guy and they wound up in Utah, close to us. Oh, okay. Uh, but like my my mom, my sister has been married multiple times and divorced multiple times. Okay. I, on the other hand, have been married to the same lovely woman for almost forty five years now. Wow! And so, I, I and I promise we'll we'll change the topic eventually. Do you? How can you? Do you have anything to ascribe? you breaking that pattern, that family, that familial pattern? Uh, I don't. I, uh, it's a complete mystery to me. Okay. Well, well, good for you. I mean, I mean, that, that's, I mean, clearly if you think about it, you know, what we study as psychologists, that's an incredibly hard pattern to break, you know, what you saw as a child and, you know, even looking at your sister and, you know, all of a sudden being monogamous and being happy being monogamous is, yeah. is a pretty big deal. Well, you know, uh, sort of a, a running joke with between Connie and I, uh, we always say that we've been successful because we've had a common enemy, our five children. <laughs> so, Your five children. Yeah, five children, yeah. Uh, and I like to tell people that four of those are by mistake. I finally, I finally figured it out in the end. So... Well, well, you know, what, whatever works, you know, yeah. <laughs> what, whatever, no, seriously, whatever has worked for you has worked for you. And, yeah. and, yeah. and, I mean, and, and you're right. You know, each, each, uh, each marriage, each couple is a unique case. And there are certain things that happen in those relationships that are unique to them. And it's really hard to attribute success or failure to any one thing. Right. That, that that that's exactly right. So when you went out to BYU, um, were you thinking about academics at all? I mean, what was your major, or was that even on the radar screen? My major was baseball. Uh, that's all I really cared about. But I knew I had to do just like in high school. I knew I had to do well enough uh, academically to stay eligible to play. So, you know, my, my end goal was to become a B or C student. So I, I was not particularly interested in academics. Um, you know, there were teachers I liked, and, and that is true in high school as well. But, you know, I, I, just, uh, I just got by doing as little work as possible. Um, and all that changed when, um, I guess it was in about my junior year, I met a, a political science teacher by the name of A. Don Sorensen. And I was, my, my major had probably switched for the 15th time by then to political science. And I became interested in a little bit in political philosophy, which is sort of an odd thing for a baseball player to become interested in. And I took a course from this guy and he was spellbinding. He was uh, incredibly committed to his work. Um, I hadn't seen that in many of my teachers. 
He was an engaging lecturer. There was no active learning in the class, but but the stories he would tell about politics and people in politics were just absolutely riveting, and I became became interested in that. And so he was the first teacher that really touched me in any compelling way. Unfortunately, I took a second course in political philosophy from a different teacher who turned me completely off, uh, just a, a, a unfriendly, um, uninteresting uh, person. And at the same time, I happened to be taking a course in introductory psychology to fulfill a, a GE requirement. And um, I thought this stuff is pretty interesting. Maybe I should take another course. And I wound up taking a course from a guy by the name of Paul Robinson, who had written a book called Fundamentals of Experimental Psychology. Um, and the book was a really simply laid out book. The logic of the book was very clear, um, made a compelling argument for why we should approach human behavior from a scientific point of view. Uh, and I sort of became really totally captivated by, by him and by the, uh, by the ideas. He was not um, a particularly great teacher, but he was caring and he was interested in his students and he was interested in their learning and what was happening in their lives. And so between the compellingness of the content and the humanity of Paul, um, I became more and more interested in, in, uh, in psychology and eventually changed my major to it. So a couple things come to mind. Um, it, that's an interesting um, two dimensions. And I and actually, we, we can talk at some point later about the teacher behavior checklist that you were instrumental in creating. But you, you just mentioned um, uh, care, being a caring teacher and being a great teacher. Uh, in that case, it might have been more important for you that – he was more caring than great. I, I think so. Um, I, I, I think that's the way you make a personal connection with your students. And in contrast, you know, Don Sorensen was a great teacher, but I didn't get the same degree of personal connection with him or the field uh, like I did with Paul. So that made a that made a huge difference to me, um, and he really he really got through to me. In fact, um, I became uh, a really good student in that class. I think I got a B in Don's class, but I got an A in Paul's experimental psychology class. And um, I began to drop in to visit him during his office hours um, on occasion. And, and this one time that stands out, I was in his office. And on his wall, like, you know, like most of us, we had our, our credentials. We, he had his PhD diploma hand on the wall. And I looked up at it and I said, huh, that's what a PhD degree looks like, huh? And he said, yeah, and that's what yours will look like too. And, of course, I just about, you know, fell out of my chair. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, yeah, you're going to go to graduate school, aren't you? You're smart enough. And I said, I had never, ever really considered it before. He says, well, I think you should. I really think you should. And of course, by this time, I was a senior, and um, my grades were you know, still well down into the two-point something. I'd say two six, two seven. And he said, you know, well, we're starting a, a new program here in experimental psychology. Why don't you consider applying for it? You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll support you. <laughs> so, like, this was just crazy talk. You know, just like, what is going on here? And I thought about it a little bit more, and... Um, uh, I applied. Um, this was at a last last moment type of thing. So believe it or not, I got the GRE waived. I didn't have to take a GRE. And because of that, I was accepted on a provisional basis. And so I made it my goal. And I talked about it with Connie, who had become my wife by then, um, that I would just work my butt off that first year. And if it didn't work out, we'd do something else. And if it worked out, I'd stay. And, and I was... Um, fortunate enough to be really, really turned on and motivated enough to do well. Um, and the rest is just sort of my, my personal academic history. So Bill, when, when you're playing baseball and you injure your arm and you're told somewhere along the way that you're, you're never going to be able to play again, you're never going to be able to pitch again. Do you have that classic reaction that your life is over or that planned life is over? 
Um, I don't think it got that far with me. I think what happened was I went through a period of depression um, and sadness, and I went from about 140 pounds to about 208 um, over the course of six, seven months. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't go and watch the team play without crying, without becoming extremely sad. Um, but I had this scholarship that I felt like I had to, you know, take advantage of. And even though I still was not all that motivated in school, I was fortunate enough to come across these two teachers right. who really, who really turned my life around and really opened my eyes to education and what it could do for you. And it gave me a, a new interest for the first time. But in some ways, you know, what, and I, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in some ways it strikes me that the, the pitching injury, uh, kind of led to this, uh, this amazing career that you have enjoyed without that, you'd be on a different trajectory in your life. Right. But on the, uh, I agree with you hundred percent that, but let's go back farther. And it was baseball that got me out of Jamestown, New York. Yes. And got me to college and got me. So baseball opened the door. And I've told many people that I often think baseball saved my life. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I don't know what I would have become. I don't know if I would have, you know, turned to drugs or something else or, you know, been been stuck in a dead end job um, out of high school. I really don't know um, um, what the specifics might be, but I do feel that baseball was instrumental in doing two things. One is um, allowing me to meet my, my wife, um, who I wouldn't have met otherwise. And I'm very happy. Um, in our relationship and have been, you know, for virtually all of it. And it introduced me to education in a, in a new way, uh, a way that really opened my eyes to what life could be and the kinds of things I could do as an educated person. And I, I promise I'm not going to dwell on this too much. And, and I tend to do this with many of our podcast guests. And I even did it a little bit with, Bill McKeechee, who was, uh, I didn't want to argue with him at all. But, and, <laughs> and I, I know how, I know how you're saying it. And I know how you mean it, that baseball saved your life. But if I were going to reframe it slightly differently, I, I would reframe it that the amount of effort that you put into being an excellent and outstanding baseball player that made that, that allowed you to earn a scholarship that, um, BYU offered and gave to you led to those opportunities. Um, you, you through baseball saved your own life. It wasn't that baseball, I mean, Brigham Young wasn't just handing these out as uh, candy bars uh, freely. You earned it through your talent, through your skill, through your dedication to the sport. Wouldn't that be fair to say? Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, but I also think that uh, um, I, I don't really know how to how to say this clearly, but I also think there was something about the game that attracted me. Uh, so there was something about the nature of baseball that attracted me to it, and uh, we interacted, um, and and it was good for both of us. Yeah. Oh. I. Oh. I. Absolutely. But I. You know, a recurring theme that I have with guests, and I don't want to focus on this, is that they attribute things to luck, um, and, no, and they no, no, say, "I, I, I, no, I, I got I, I, lucky." No, I, I think there's two things there, I, and this is sort of my teaching philosophy, part of my teaching philosophy as well. I think there's opportunity. I think that's what teaching is all about: is opportunity and providing opportunities for students and learners. In my case, with baseball. Uh, I was introduced to baseball at about four or five years old. Um, the first time I picked up a baseball, I just loved how it felt in my hand. I can still remember it. And I remember I liked throwing it. And I was always throwing things as kids. We lived next to a, a, a park that was full of chestnut trees. And in the fall, when the chestnuts would fall off in their pods, we'd break open the pods and we'd have chestnut wars in the neighborhood. We would just go around throwing chestnuts at each other. And so throwing was just a part of my life. And that sort of you know, gave me the arm strength and, uh, you know, the, the skill to throw things accurately. 
baseball came along uh, more and more in my life and provided an opportunity for me to play it. But you're absolutely right. I worked very hard at it. And as a result, um, I had some some degree of success with it. So yeah, it's not all about it's not all about luck. I do believe in what some of the great minds have said about luck. You know, um, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. Those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I, I do think there are some fortuitous moments where where things align. But I I, I think sometimes, um, and I think I think sometimes it's a humility piece that people don't want to seem braggadocious, and so they they. They tend to uh, tend to uh, just say I was lucky. I think that was Bill McKeechy, for example. So, hey, so can I tell you a short no, story? About, can I talk to you, tell you about a short story with Bill? Oh, you please do. This, but uh, but maybe some of our listeners may not. But I had that, like you, I had the great great opportunity to interview Bill at one time. This was for uh, an APS session uh, during one of the annual meetings. And I asked Bill if he re- would reflect upon his life and tell me what he was most proud of in his life. And I was expecting to, you know, hear something about, you know, teaching, because this is what we all think of about uh, Bill McKeechee. But he, he, without hesitating, said, yeah, uh, I'm most proud in my life of my 30 no-hitters in fast pitch softball. And yep. It just took me completely back. And so th- there I felt an automatic kinship with, with Bill. Uh, because we had this passion for for the game, whether it be baseball or softball, it's basically the same the same game played by this by the basically the same rules. Um, and so, Bill has this very interesting backstory as well, both in terms of his uh, life as a religious individual and has his life as a softball player. Uh, and you're right, Bill would talk about his his uh, role as a softball pitcher. As both a combination of opportunity and plain hard work, and um, and devotion to the game. Yeah, did you at not at Auburn? Were there any uh, like faculty leagues for baseball or softball? Did you, you get involved with that? Um, you know, I did. Um, we had a uh, a departmental softball team. I played for one year, but you know, thinking I could sort of. Um, you know, get back to my old self, but it just wasn't the same. And so I only stayed on it for a year. Okay. Now, b- before we leave BYU, and I'm guessing this happened probably in the master's program, um, I know I've heard you at co- either at conferences or over a dinner or something. Um, tell us about the influence of Hal Miller. Um, I met Hal as an undergraduate, actually. He had just come from uh, Harvard. Um, he had got a degree in experimental psychology under uh, Dick Kernstein, um, who is most famous for his um, discovery and elaboration of the matching law. And he also had courses from Skinner and from E.O. Wilson in the biology department. Um, to this day, Hal is probably the brightest person I've ever met, as well as the best teacher I've ever seen. Uh, just in, an incredible, credible human being in, in every respect. Um, uh, I took an undergraduate motivation class from Hale, and I and I loved it, and it just reinforced my interest in psychology. And um, so I, I knew of Hale, and he knew a little bit about me. Um, I got involved in, the, in graduate school there, and, and at BYU at the time, they didn't have a master's program. You went right for the PhD. Um, so I was uh, in the in the graduate program, and Paul Robinson was my major professor. And Paul's big thing was errorless learning back in the day. You know, trying to see how learning unfolds when an organism makes no or few mistakes. So I spent a lot of time sitting in these darkened rooms, looking into a operant chamber, watching pigeons peck keys. And I was, I became bored out of my mind. I mean, I, I just couldn't handle it. Um, I, I just, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it, but that's what Paul was into. And at the same time, I, you know, I had been taking some graduate courses from Hale and he was really interested in human operant behavior. That is to say, he's the study of humans 
uh, under controlled operant conditions. And I became interested in that. And so I was really at a crossroads because I didn't want to hurt Paul's feelings, but I just knew that I was not happy studying what he was interested in studying. So eventually I approached Hal, I told him my situation, and he said he understood it and he would support me either way and he would be happy to take me on as a student if it didn't work out with Paul. And that's exactly what happened. So um, Hal and I began to work together and he did a couple remarkable things. Um, First was he just gave me the keys to the lab. He said, do whatever you want. He said, you have complete control over this portion of the lab. Whatever you want to do, let's run the idea by me. We'll work on it together. But, you know, you're the guy who's going to come up with the ideas. You know, it's, it's wow. up to you. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, that's yes, it is. Pretty, pretty powerful. And then uh, the second thing he did is I would show him data, and there was nothing but encouragement. And then I would write these things up. And although he would absolutely rip my writing to shreds, I mean – it's, it was worse than Charles Brewer editing a manuscript. It, it, was, it was blood everywhere, but always encouragement. And so that's how I became a writer was through, through Hale's influence. But he, he just encouraged me every which way as possible. And as a result, by the time we got out of graduate school, I got out of graduate school with him, um, I had 12 or 15 publications just like that, because I had to free research what I wanted to do with his support. And we were co-authors and everything. And most of the time, he wasn't worried about being first author. He had no, you know, no dog in that hunt. He just wanted to, to work with me. I wanted to work with him. He wanted to encourage me. And we made an outstanding team. It, but it, and so, Bill, in how many years, though? Were, I mean, two or three years at BYU with him? Okay, so here's so I worked with Hale for four years. Okay, um, what and what happened was really really interesting. Um, I became interested in teaching um, as a graduate student, but not to the point where I was really interested in mastering that craft. I wanted to be good, and so as a graduate student, I had the opportunity to teach almost every semester past my first year. Um, so I got lots of teaching experience, and I taught courses that, um, you know, were really sort of unusual. Like I taught a course in sociobiology because Hale had developed an interest in sociobiology. Of course, he, he, was, he studied under E.O. Wilson for a couple of courses, and he wanted to sort of bring that perspective into the department. So we developed a course called sociobiology, and I got to teach it. I also got to teach for BYU Extension, which means that I was teaching classes after hours to non-traditional students. <laughs> and those non-traditional students happened to be – it happened to be uh, the military over at Dugway Proving Ground in Western Utah. So once a week, I would drive over there and teach a four-hour class. Um, you know, I'd have to go through the guard stations. When the students came to class, many of them brought their weapons because they were just getting off uh, duty. So I was in a classroom full of weapons, and uh, it was really a highly unusual experience, but a great experience. So I got a lot of teaching experience. Uh, so when time came to wrap up my PhD, finish my dissertation, and apply for jobs, I, I did so very smoothly. Um, and this was back in 1980. There was not a lot of jobs for experimental psychologists, let alone an operant experimental psychologist back in those days. So um, the first year out, um, I applied to 27 jobs, and I got 27 rejections, not even an interview. So what happened then was my chair came to me, a guy by the name of Don Fleming, and he said, look it. He said, don't defend your dissertation. I know it's done. Don't defend it. And I can keep you on as a graduate student instructor, and I can pay you more as a graduate student instructor uh, than I can as a, um, um, what's the word? Adjunct. Adjunct faculty. And so yeah. I talked about it with my wife. We agreed that was a good strategy, and I did that. So the next year, I defended my dissertation, and I applied to 26 more jobs, okay, and again with the same result, zero interest, zero interviews. So I was sort of stuck. We had no idea what we were going to do, and by this time, we had had a child. Our first, our first child was born, Tara, and um, we, we had a second child, uh, our oldest boy named Colin, and my wife was pregnant with a third child. 
And um, boy, boy, what, what were we going to do? And then out of nowhere, my department chair, Don Fleming, calls me and he says, I just got a call from a guy over at a small school in Colorado, in Alamosa, Colorado, called Adams State College. And they had a last minute resignation. They're looking for somebody can teach. Are you interested? And if you are, can I give them your name? And I said, absolutely. I mean, let's do it. Let's let's do this. So I got a call from uh, the chair of that department, a guy by the name of Bob Compton. And uh, Bob said, you know, can you come over for right away for an interview? And uh, we'll take care of all the expenses and stuff. No problem. So this was on July 1st. So on July 3rd, I flew over for the interview. And um, uh, they picked me up at a little small airport. And we drove into campus. And before I could actually sit down, um, uh, I met three or four faculty, and they sort of for, you know, presented me with the interview standing up in the outer office of the department chair's office. And they basically had three questions. Three questions, okay? This was the interview. Okay. First question, uh, do I have anything against farmers? <laughs> I said, what? I said, no. I said, of course not. And so, okay, second question. Um, do you have anything against Chicanos? And I said, uh, no, no, I've never met a Chicano. Um, I've never had a conversation with Chicano. I don't know anything about Chicanos. So, no, I, I don't have a problem. And they said, oh, great, great. Okay, well, one last question for you. Uh, would you work for $18,500 a year? And I said, sure. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money um, now, but back then in 1981, that was a lot of money given the fact that I was having this, you know, I had this graduate student salary. Right. They, they said, okay, show us your teaching evaluations. So I whipped out my teaching evaluations, looked at them and said, you're hired. So they, they and I never sat down. I, ne I never sat down. So they- You're still in the hallway standing up. Uh, still in the hall, uh, the outer office, right. Oh my God. So, uh, so uh, they said, okay, let's go to lunch. So they took me to a, a wonderful little Mexican restaurant, which happens to be my favorite type of food. And then they rushed me back to the airport. And that was the interview. And I was offered the job on the spot. So, so you I didn't give a talk? Yeah. Pardon? You didn't give a talk or anything? No, there was no talk. Uh-uh. Hmm. No, they, oh were, they were in a hurry to finish or to find someone for this position because it was a last-minute uh, resignation. Sure. They had the course on the books, and they wanted to make sure they got someone right away to, to fill that part of their, um, their teaching agenda for the fall. It seems like they could have asked you those questions over the phone. They could have. They could have. Hmm. Well, I, I, let me tell you another part of the story that I that I always have always really enjoyed. Um, on my way into the building, you know, uh, I had arrived at the airport. They picked me up. In my way into their building, uh, suddenly uh, a white pickup truck, old white pickup truck, stops in the middle of the road, and a guy gets out, and he's got these uh, Farmer Johns on. He's got field boots on that come up, you know, almost to his knees. And then he's got a, a, a t-shirt on. And uh, he, he rushes over to me, he wants to meet me. I'm thinking, who is this guy? Who is this guy? It turns out he was the interim president of the university. And he was a member of the psychology department, or excuse me, the division of human behaviors. His name was Marv Motes. Um, and he and I turned out to be incredibly good friends. And we had this running battle about a big school mentality versus a small school mentality. And his whole goal during that first year was to teach me about the importance of teaching and the importance, and the importance of small liberal arts colleges uh, in, the, in the American scene for educating students who might not otherwise have an opportunity to get an education. Wow. Now, I happen to know that uh, didn't Adam State invite you back um, – a couple of years ago yeah, they to did. They did. Uh, give some talk. Now did, and did you tell the story of your job interview? I did. I told the story of the job interview. I told the story about Marv Motes. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was great. And Marv has passed since then. Oh, okay. But many of the people there knew Marv um, and his uh, reputation. Um, he was a statistics teacher and uh, was, re and he was, he was a funny guy. I mean, just hilarious. And he wanted to, his goal was to write a funny book about statistics. Of course, he never got the chance because he passed away. 
Well, I, I'm just thinking that their screening questions are probably a little bit different now. I, I would imagine. I would imagine. So, so Bill, I, I want to ask you a little bit about your involvement in STP, if I could. Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, I, I came on as secretary of STP, I think right after you were finishing up your presidential year. And um, by all accounts, uh, your productivity in STP, like your productivity in your career was prodigious. Um, and, and so I, I guess my question is kind of general, but also specific to STP. Where, where did that come from, that drive to be so productive? And, it, you know, it just strikes me, you know, just coming into STP and seeing what you've done and, you know, looking at the number of graduate students you worked with at Auburn, where, where did that, that drive to be so productive. How, how did you do that? And I'm guessing even in retirement, how are you doing that with all that you do? <laughs> uh, baseball. It all goes back to baseball and the drive to win the drive to be uh, at the top of your game. Yeah. But I, that, that gives, that's the motivator. But I mean, I mean, what's the, I mean, I, I guess maybe I didn't ask it right. I mean, but it, it it from the outsider looking in, it looks like someone who never slept, someone who never had a life, someone who could not have possibly raised five kids, someone who could not have possibly been in a happy marriage. You, do you know what I mean? I mean, someone who's that productive, who's writing that many letters of recommendation, who's publishing that many things, giving that many national talks, can't also have a well-balanced life, but I think you really did. I mean, I mean, when I ask how did that work, how, how were you able to work so productively? What was the secret? I, uh, well, I, you know, I think baseball taught me a lot of lessons about life and about being successful. And, and I think I was able to somehow translate the language of baseball into the language of academics and marriage and having fun in life. Um, and that's only part of it. The, another important part is the fact that you get, you got to have a supportive environment in which to work. And my wife, um, has supported me in every facet of my life. Um, even when I've wanted to do crazy things like compete in Ironman races and things like that. Um, so she's always been there. So she allowed me to have that freedom and the time, uh, to, in, in order to take on those kind of responsibilities. And, you know, my thing is, is that when you see a job that needs to be done, figure out everything that is going to be required to do the job well, and then devote yourself to it. Um, I don't get by on a lot of sleep. Um, I sleep probably at the most about six hours at night. Um, and I'm, you know, even now in retirement, I'm up by 4, 4.30 every morning because I have things I want to do during the day. Um and I don't want those things to interfere with things that I might do with my wife or I might do with friends, those kinds of things. So um, I think uh, I've always been driven. Um, a, a part of it may, who knows, may have been because um, I felt a need to prove myself because of the way my family was when I was a kid. Um, you know, it's really, it's really tough to go back and sort of, you know, armchair all the reasons why you turned out like you did. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. And 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 I I and I don't want to force you to do that. I it, the the question is more out of uh, admiration and a little bit of envy, to be honest with you, because you know it's like, oh my gosh, I you know look at everything that he did and he does, and it's like, you know, the folks that you and I hang out with or and hung out with an STP are all very productive and very busy, but there are a handful of people, people like you and Regan Gurung and Sue France who just tend to get, and Jane Hallinan, who just tend to get more done than the mere mortals of the rest of us. And it's just kind of like, you know, if there's a secret sauce, you know, a, I, I want you to spill it, but I, I don't think there is. I just think it's, 
super hard work, being super focused. Um, I, I, I think you, obviously you're right. There were some skills that you generalized from your time in baseball that carried over really well for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when I take a look at your career and I, I have followed it, um, you've been incredibly productive, incredibly active, done a tremendous amount of things far above the average academic for sure. So I think you got to put yourself too in that same category, Eric, and uh, you're very humble about it. But, but I think that's the way most people are in STP because, because they're teachers and, and they realize that teaching is a very humble and noble profession. And uh, uh, I don't think the teachers who become great teachers, who become instrumental in affecting the lives of their students are, uh, are arrogant. I, I think all of them one, all of them are grateful for the opportunity they've had to teach and to influence others and for the influence of so many others uh, on them. I mean, I've had, I mean, we, we just within STP, I've had so many powerful friends uh, in terms of the way they've been able to influence me and the way they've guided my career, guarded my life and made me stop and think about what I was doing and whether I was in the right path or not. So I think, I think all of us in STP are very fortunate to have found this really closely knit family of incredibly good and productive friends. So, so Bill, I'm going to, I'm going to say thank you for that. And, you know, I've, I've got important mentors, um, some younger than me, some older than me who have, you know, been in my ear, one in particular, um, who, uh, has heard me take compliments and then twist them around and make a joke about it or, or say, uh, yeah, you won that, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd win an award and I would make a joke about it. And, and she has taught me to stop doing that um, because uh, in some ways it could be uh, demeaning to the uh, compliment giver. Absolutely. So Absolutely. it's really hard. Uh, it, it's so thank you. And I'm, I'm just going to not make a joke and demean the compliment giver, but that, that is really hard. Uh, you, you mentioned the people who have been supportive. Um, do you, do you want to say a little bit? I, I know that you are part of a very close, uh, for lack of a better term, brotherhood, um, of folks that, that you are super close to, uh, beyond just, uh, collegial, I would say. Um, do you want to say a little bit about how those bonds formed and, and that relation, those relationships? Um, well, to sort of um, fill out that little sketch, um, there are, there have been five or six of us over the years. Uh, and I think we're probably going on around the 14th or 15th year now that uh, we've gotten together. In fact, we call ourselves the Psych Brothers. Um, we, we meet once a year, uh, we take turns hosting the group at our house, at our houses. Uh, we spend about a long weekend together, sometimes four or five days and we just hang out and talk. And, uh, you know, if there's something to do, uh, we go do it. We go out to dinner quite a bit. We have great discussions. Uh, even now, um, you know, this morning, uh, we're starting eight thirty my time. I've already had probably... 12 to 15 emails um, among them uh, that we respond to. So we talk each day. Um, and these, and let me just name these folks for you. Uh, there's Bill Hill. There's Randy Smith, Dave Johnson, Barney Bynes, Ken Keith, and Steve Davis. Um, and we, we became close and developed friendships uh, by going to conferences. We met at other conferences and we would, uh, uh, you know, started out small, just, you know, just usually a couple of us getting together and then more of us got together and we discovered we had all these things we liked. And it was Steve Davis actually, who, uh, hosted the first, um, boys weekend, as we call it, um, at, at his house in, in, uh, Hideaway Lakes, Texas. And he just wanted to have a way that we could, uh, we could all gather. And part of the reason for that was because one of the members uh, of this, you know, really tight brotherhood has suffered a, a great personal loss, uh, the death of a spouse. And Steve wanted to get us all together to help support that individual. And 
Uh, we gathered at his house and we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, talked about crazy things, laughed a lot, laughed until we cried about so many things. And uh, we just decided this was a good idea and we'd, we'd continue it. And we've, uh, we've done it every year since, except for this year. We were supposed to hold it here in Salida, Colorado, at my house. But of course, uh, COVID put the kibosh on that as it has so many other kinds of get togethers and reunions. Well, it, and it sounds like the best of a family reunion where you get together and you tell your stories and you uh, enjoy each other's company. Yeah. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Did, 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 did the, uh, did those bonds start at MacTop? Was that the, con- the mid America conference? You know, that's a really good question because I think um, everybody but me can trace her roots back to that conference. Uh, yeah, I, I've heard so many things about, you know, Joe Palladino starting MacTop, I, I believe, mid 80s in Indiana. Um, I know Wayne Whiten got his idea for his intro psych textbook there. I mean, yeah. um, I, 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 you know, I think Jane Hallinan got introduced to the STP crowd there. I mean, um, there's a lot of people who can trace uh, lineage and friendships back to MacTop. Oh yeah, I with I, uh, I I came I came onto the STP scene uh, several years later than the rest of these guys did. So um, I didn't meet them at MacTop. I didn't know anything about MacTop. I um, I think my first teaching conference was actually NITOP, uh, and I was a guest of a publisher there. And that's where I, I met Jane there. That's where I first met Jane. Uh, and of course, fell in love with her like so many others have. Um, just, she's just so bright, so energetic, so fun, so insightful, so supportive. I mean, there's, you know, you could go on all day listing positive adjectives to describe her. Uh, so I felt a real bond and warmth there with her. Um, and then I went over to CTOP, which Bill Hill had organized over in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And that's where I met Bill for the first time. And then eventually through Bill, I began meeting other folks. Bill introduced me to Steve Davis. And then Steve Davis and I got together, talked, and we actually collaborated on a, on a, a really uh, interesting book together that we dedicated to both uh, Bill McKeechee and Charles Brewer. It's called Teaching of Psychology, Essays in Honor of, uh, of Brewer and McKeechee. Um, and then from there, I, you know, I, I started you know, becoming more and more interested in research on teaching, started submitting articles. And through that, I met Randy. And uh, when he was editor of uh, TOP, and then that got me more and more involved going to teaching conferences, presenting data, those kinds of things. And that's where I met, uh, you know, Dave and Barney and Ken. Um, uh, And one thing led to another, and it turned out we just all became really good friends. Yeah, so th- those connections are, you know, in- invaluable. I mean, they, they just are. I mean, uh I I I met Steve Davis through listening to him give a night top invited address mm-hmm. and went up to him and had a conversation and a couple of years later we co-author a book together and uh, I I I get introduced to Randy through submitting to TOP uh and you know all of those folks that you've mentioned are incredibly gracious with their time and mentoring uh I remember you know Bill Hill Bill Hill gave me my first chance to keynote ever in my life at CTOP, yeah. you know, and, and was kind and gentle and, and just so generous. Um, and so um, as, as our, as we can say with so many, so many of our STP colleagues. You know, I, 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 you're absolutely right. I, I've often likened going to a teaching conference as walking into a big group hug as opposed to a research conference where you're walking into fisticuffs. <laughs> it's just totally different feeling. And, and I think uh, that kind of warmth and support really is a powerful inspiration in helping people become who they eventually become as teachers and researchers on teaching. Absolutely. So, Bill, I, I, I know we're running up on, towards the end of our, our time in this chat, but one of the things I wanted to to touch base with you on is that, you know, you're uh, a teacher and a researcher at an R1 school at Auburn, yet you 
you and you were um, doing research about teaching, yet you you're one of the, I think one of the rare individuals who were active and successful in the teaching world, and certainly in STP. There's not many others. Um, how 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 were you able to navigate that? Was it a disadvantage to you in the Auburn community uh, to be a teaching engaged researcher? Um, yes and no. Uh, let me let me sort of step back and explain that a little bit. Um, like I said earlier, I was not bent on becoming a great teacher when I was starting out in this game. Um, I wanted to become a laboratory researcher. And so um, the, the position at Adam State was a one-year position. It was temporary. We we're going to close down. So I, um, I had to look for a job. And I, years before, I had met a guy by the name of Peter Harzum at a psychonomic society meeting in Phoenix. And he and I sort of became friends, even though I was much, much his junior. And he, um, he remembered uh, that meeting. And when he had a chance to organize a uh, symposium one time, he invited me to give a couple papers at it. So I did. And that sort of solidified our relationship even more. Um, and then out of the blue, they had this position open up at Auburn uh, for a human operant researcher. He called me while I was at M State, asked me to apply for it. And then lo and behold, I got an interview, which just shocked me because I'd never had a real interview before. So I came to Auburn, um, gave the interview, not thinking that I would ever get the job. And uh, I, they offered me the job. It's just like, this is just a miracle to me. You know, it's, it was unbelievable. So uh, it came down to Auburn and I became, you know, very active in my lab, um, you know, published a couple papers, uh, human operant research. And then one day out of the blue, Peter came to me and he had become interim chair by then. And he said, Bill, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but we've got a real problem with our graduate students in that they um, are being asked to teach courses. Um, oftentimes they would show up uh, in the fall uh, as a first year graduate student uh, They'd be called into the chair's office. They'd be given a book and say, go home and make a syllabus tonight because tomorrow you're teaching this course. Oh, no. Yes. They, there was a course on the books called Teaching of Psychology, but it was taught by a guy who really wasn't much of a teacher. And he would come in and he would start class by saying, does anybody have any questions? And if there were no questions, class would be dismissed. So there was really no sort of, of instruction, articulation about teaching, teaching methods, good ways, bad ways, those kinds of things. So Peter asked me if I would sort of come in and do what I could to put that situation right. And I was very hesitant about that because I had this research career going and I didn't want teaching to interfere with it. But yet Peter was this really close personal friend and I felt I couldn't let him down. So I, I got involved um, and it was just amazing. Um, I started I started with the idea that if I'm going to teach these people how to teach, I should know what it means to be a good teacher. And of course, that led me to the next question is, is why stop at good? Why not go for excellent teaching? And that led me to the question of what's the difference between a good teacher and an excellent teacher? So I became fascinated with these questions in this quest to sort of help graduate students become competent teachers. And I found I really loved it. I mean, I loved it. So I came to Peter one day and I said, Peter, I've, I've got this problem. And he said, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, I'm sort of torn, you know, whether I want to stay involved with what I'm doing with teaching or whether I want to go back to the lab. And, you know, like I said, Peter was a very, very bright guy. And he said to me, he said, look, it's just very simple. Just take a day or two and ask yourself this question. Which audience is more important? And I said, huh, what are you, audiences, what are you talking about? He said, well, is it more important for you to reach teachers or is it more important for you to reach researchers? Where do you think you could have the biggest impact? And then that prompted me to think uh, a thought that changed my life forever. And that was this. I could spend six months to a year conducting research, taking another few months to try to write the paper up, submit it, go through that whole rigmarole, and it may take two years to publish a paper, 
and maybe five or six people will read it. But every time I stood up before a class, whether I was teaching teachers or whether I was teaching graduate students or whether I was teaching undergraduates, I have a chance to impact how those people look at psychology, the science of psychology, how they reason, how they think right then and there. And I have a chance to influence thousands more individuals at any given time. And so that, that's how I became involved in teaching. I answered that question. And the question was, I wanted to have influence where I could have the best impact. And that was in the classroom. So and it strikes. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was say, that leads to another issue. And that is like, how are my colleagues at Auburn going to react to that? Right. And that was, that's your original question. And, and sorry, I took so long to get to it. No, no, no. It was a great answer. And I think it's really helpful for our audience to, to hear that. Thank you. So they, um, they were not positive at first, <laughs> uh, particularly people within the experimental program. In fact, it was got so bad for me that I resigned my membership in the experimental program and became an independent, unaffiliated faculty member. So I wasn't a member of any program at all. Um, it, it got so bad that way. But I always had the support of whoever was department chair because they knew, first of all, that they never had to worry about anybody teaching introductory psychology because that's what I taught. Uh, and we taught large sections of it. And they never had to worry about anybody supervising graduate students and doing it well because I was doing that. So I always took that those two problems off of their plate. So they gave me a tremendous amount of support in the department. And, and that's basically all you need. If you have the support of the chair and you're okay with having um, lukewarm relationships with the rest of your faculty, then that's all I had to do. And I, Because to me, the most important thing was my teaching. And I, I formed closer relationships with my graduate students than ever did any other faculty member. And that was true until I, I took a, a, a position at uh, Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina, um, and where people really cared about teaching. People really, really cared about teaching. So, um, so that's sort of my story at Auburn. And so you, you were at Auburn, then you went to Appalachian State, then you came back to Auburn? Yeah, what happened was, um, I, what I would often do for my graduate students is I would sort of survey the, the job scene. And so I would, I, this was back in the days when everything was posted in print media. So I would look at the, uh, you know, the, uh, the observer and the monitor and, and just make sure they didn't miss anything. And so one day I came across this job opportunity. Uh, it was for a, an endowed professorship at, at, at um, Appalachian State. And if you took my Vita and you took the job application, the job ad, it, it was like they were identical. And so I, I told Connie about that. I said, Connie, you got to look at this. And she said, well, you got to apply to it. You know, you've always wanted to, you love North Carolina. We spent a lot of time in North Carolina kayaking and hiking when the kids were young. And so I wound up applying for it and got the job and went up there. I took a leave from Auburn a University at the time. And that's a whole different story because that was a battle as well. Um, but when I got up there, it turned out that their retirement program would not gonna, was not going to work out for me. I was going to lose quite a, quite a lot of money in my retirement if I stayed up there. Um, I had gotten some bad advice from a retirement planner when I first looked at that position. And Connie, you know, thank goodness, she said, you know, before we make a final decision about App State or Auburn, Let's let's just review our finances one more time. And we did. And that's when we found out that there was this disconnect between what two different financial planners were saying to us. And as a result, I had to come back to Auburn. But it was a win win situation because I had a good situation there. And Auburn was really, really good to me. Don't let my what I said about the department and how they reacted to my, you know, going the teaching route versus research route uh, dismay anybody because I had a wonderful job. I, I was I adored that job. It's what kept me in Alabama. Um, it, it really, really was a wonderful, wonderful job. Well, and you know, it, so Bill, I, I really appreciate you sharing all that because from an outsider like me looking in, um, you were so incredibly successful there. And, uh, I, I don't want to slight any of your other graduate students, but so many of your grad students went on to have 
really successful, remarkable careers. The four that I personally know, and again, I'm going to apologize for people I don't mention, Jared Keeley, Tracy Zinn, Jessica Irons, Brian Seville, and I, I know there's many, many more. But even th- those four individuals made, have already made substantial contributions to the discipline, to STP, teaching of psychology. I mean, it's remarkable if one student, one graduate student goes on to do that. But that many in a, a graduate professor's career is just amazing and astounding. Oh, they're, first of all, they're very good people. They had, they had a good grounding in science and were highly motivated before they ever, ever came across my door. Um, they're very hard workers and I, I love every one of them. In fact, um, um, and I will brag just a little bit here. Seven of those graduate students went on to win national teaching awards. And that is, in fact, my proudest moment. Of all the things that have happened to me in my career, I'm most proud of those students uh, yeah. for, for what they've done and what they continue to do. Ab- absolutely. So, Bill, I, I, I've, I've kept you about an hour. Is, is there anything that you wanted to mention or you were hoping that we would talk about that I have somehow skipped over or forgotten? Is there any? I want to make sure that, that we hit all the things that you wanted to chat about. I, I guess there's only one thing that I would say that we, we had hoped to touch on earlier, but we really didn't. And that was the work with the TBC. And I really don't want to say much about the TBC. Um, other than, yeah, so, other than, the yeah, so, so for the audience, that's the teacher behavior checklist. Correct. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, um, um, th- we all make choices, um, in our careers and we all make a choice of what kind of teacher we can be become. And there's no reason we should settle for mediocrity, um, in our careers in any way, shape or form. And that the important thing is, is that um, we strive to become an excellent teacher. And I'm not the first person to, to make that point. Others have made it before me, but we often forget it. Um, um, for most of us, for many of us who work hard, who study teaching, who are willing to modify our teaching based on data. Let me say that again, modify our teaching based on data and what works and what's effective in producing student learning. To become an excellent teacher is with, with all of our grasp. Um, I don't believe for a minute that um, great teachers are, are born. I believe they're made. I think it takes considerable hard work um, and a lot of, lot of time in preparation, a lot of time caring for students and interacting with students, but it's all within our grasp. And so if, if, that's, if that's what you want to be, if that's what anybody wants to be in their careers, there, there is a formula to, to do it. And uh, I think what the work with the TBC does is to reveal a great deal of that formula to people. And of course, they, they will take that formula and modify it to fit their situations. Uh, there's no one way to become a master teacher. And that's sort of what I would like to, to, to end on is, is that point there. Well, Bill, it, it, it's been a pleasure to reconnect with you and, um, I, I, I say this frequently on the podcast, you know, I'm not the official representative of anything right now, but um, if I were, um, we miss you. We miss your voice. We miss your influence. Uh, we're so thankful that we have books and journal articles and things that you've generated. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful for the time that we've spent uh, connecting to uh, have this podcast. Uh- I, and I, I feel the same way. I, I, I can't thank you enough. In fact, during this podcast, it really made me miss my career and made me miss teaching and filled me with a little bit of nostalgia. So, and that's a good thing. That's, that's a really good thing. Um, I, and I appreciate all that you're doing. I think these podcasts are important. It's a great way to, to link different people together that may have uh, uh, been out of the picture for a long time or who, who the, the newer generation teachers may not be familiar with. So I really thank you for this opportunity and I wish you the, the best of success in everything that you do. I, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Bill, thank you again so much. Mm-hmm.